well, welcome back to peacefulness. I am very excited now. I don't get excited by too many guests, but I've always wanted to sit down with this guy because he's one of the, well, he's probably the number one astrophysicist in the world, a rock star of space. Even as we've been sitting here, he's been telling me what's on my own screen behind me because to me, it looks like just a big maze that he knows. And he is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you for coming. You happen to be in the country, I just happen to be in the hood. Before we go any further, what is this thing behind we put here? Okay, so these stars that are coming through, that's just special effects. But in the background is an actual image of the Milky Way galaxy. Really? And coming up right now is the galactic center behind us, and in the center, there is a supermassive black hole dining on any stars that wander too close. Look, you have a gigantically large brain for this kind of stuff, right? You accept that it's the same size as everybody else's brain. I just prioritize what I care about differently from others. Well, I think what you're brilliant to do, you've got this terrific book which we'll come to in a moment, but you're brilliantly crystallizing the really important questions in life. One of which is how long have we got here? Yeah, well, there are some ideas about that, because we still don't know enough about the forces that will end it all. Sorry. Uh, we might have a hundred years on Earth at the rate we're going. Really? No, sorry. There's Earth issues that require geopolitical solutions, self-harm. Okay, correct. And then there's the universe, the death of the sun, the collision of the Milky Way galaxy with the Andromeda galaxy, and possibly the Big Rip. How would, okay, how would the sun die? Oh, the sun, like any star, will run out of fuel in its core, and it starts changing. It starts bloating and getting so large that it will engulf the orbit of Mercury and Venus and come very close to Earth. So imagine looking on the horizon, and sunrise is half the sky. Okay, that would be terrifying. Is this even starting to happen? No, not yet. No, we have another several billion years. Okay, if you're gonna prioritize what that's right, that's a dropped intro, isn't it? You know, people said that to start with what you're worried about. Yeah, let that one go. Alright, but there's another one, the big rip. That if the expansion of the universe accelerates at a continued rate and it goes unchecked, the universe will be expanding. In 22 billion years, it'll be expanding faster than the fabric of space-time can keep up with it, and it'll just rip. And I'm terrified by this for 22 billion years. Why are you terrified? You're not going to be here. Nobody, you know, is going to be here. I just, it's okay to be scared of things that we can't stop. Climate change, apparently. Are you worried about the big rip? We're going to stop the big rip of the universe. The big rig would be, we're pretty incompetent on so many levels. I would not hold that whole high hope. What about another threat to civilization here? I had the last interview with Professor Stephen Hawking, which was a memorable experience about his study in Cambridge University, and I asked him about the threat from AI, artificial intelligence. This is what you say. Oh, sure. Is artificial intelligence going to be the end of us? And if it's not, how do we best work with it? There is a greater danger from artificial intelligence if we allow it to become self-designing, for then it can improve itself rapidly, and we may lose control. Now, I'm reading more and more about the potential for AI to self-design. Is it going to happen? Do you think there's no reason to think that that won't happen? The question is, what minute will that occur? Because the moment it becomes self-aware and it can learn on its own, what do you learn exponentially? What did he mean, Professor Hawking, by self-designing? Well, just consider how long do you go to school to learn how to read, write, and do arithmetic? Or lately, it just looks like people just read or write, but no arithmetic. How long is that? You're in school for years and years and years. A computer that is self-aware and has access to all the knowledge of the internet, it can build on whatever foundation it had in the previous moment to accelerate that learning. So it can acquire all knowledge and all wisdom in a matter of minutes. Are we empowering this? Should we stop? 
Should we hit the buffers on this? There are people, experts, who definitely feel that way. I'm not as apocalyptic about it. I think AI is not, we're not going to build the one machine that controls everything. But right now, if you had told someone 20 years ago, I drive a car that can steer itself and tell me where grandma's house is to avoid traffic in real time, they would say that's AI. Okay, in the days of the Jetsons, they imagined robots as humanoid objects walking around doing tasks. They weren't thinking that the car was the robot, that the telescope was the robot, that your coffee machine is the robot. They weren't thinking that they had a robot operate the coffee machine, right? The robot drove your car. So, if we infuse AI in all the areas of our lives that serve our needs, then I don't see AI becoming centralized in a way that then takes over. Some people think that Elon Musk is AI. You know, either you knew him when he's only worth a hundred billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew him when he had a great line. He says, you know how to make a small fortune in space? Start with a big fortune. That was a good line. But now he made a big fortune. He's doing lots of very interesting things in space. But one of the issues up there is the space is getting quite cluttered with stuff, including Elon's. I mean, what's the answer to this? Yeah, it's not clear. And just today, one of the reasons why I'm in London is to attend a space sustainability summit. Look at those two words together, space sustainability. We see these trails of satellites going across the sky. They call them constellations of satellites, and that pisses me off, because a constellation of stars that don't move across your sky. They took our word and caught naming their satellites after this. So there's thousands of satellites in the sky, creating these streaks. How dangerous is that? Well, first, it's ugly to those who want to just bask in the majesty of the night sky. Plus, it makes further space commerce hard because space gets crowded then. And some satellites have been actively destroyed. China did it first, we did it second, Russia did it third. Okay, I didn't destroy your satellite. I destroyed one of my own. But you saw it, okay. Have you been to space? No, no. Would you like to? I okay. So, you know, the folks like Jeff Bezos, all these guys, William Shatner. William Shatner. So if this is a schoolroom globe, you know how high up they went, the thickness of two dimes. They're nothing really. And I'm an astrophysicist. You're gonna say that's bad. I'm not. Where do you want to go? Go to moon, Mars, beyond, giving a destination that's not boldly going where hundreds have gone before. This matter. Professor Hawking told me if he knew he had his last day on Earth, it was all about to end, AI, or otherwise, he said he would want to be with his family, playing Wagner and drinking champagne. What would you do? Wow, okay. Literally, I said to you right now, all right, you're right. The world is about to end, and it's happening in six hours. What are you gonna do? I would say, what can I do with my intellect and those of others to prevent the world from ending in six hours? But assuming you couldn't do anything. No, no, I don't assume that. Excuse me. Okay, you have these photos of people escaping cities that are about to be leveled by a hurricane. What are you gonna do? No one is saying, why don't we tap the cyclonic energy of the hurricane, use that energy to drive the power needs of the city, and then the hurricane goes away? You know who thinks that way? STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and math. Professor Hawking. He had this obsession about working out what the black hole was, right? What is your obsession? What's your weird thing you would love to crack that's never been solved? I want to know. Our equations tell us that if you go into a black hole, the time works out so that the future history of the universe you just came from plays out to infinity, and another spacetime opens up in front of you. So I want a mapping of all the new spacetimes that the black holes are providing. So you're all basically obsessed with the same thing, black holes. Well, who wouldn't be? I find them a little bit black, where's black holes? The way kids are obsessed with T-Rex, every kid knows a T-Rex, right? Yeah, I think it's because it's a threat that it can eat you. 
That has earned its respect, Neil. This book, Welcome Universe. Absolutely fantastically fascinating. Thank you. You are remarkably fascinating. This is like the original textbook that spawned a series of books. This latest one is The Universe in 3D. Right. There are glasses that are part of it, and the objects in the universe pop, and they transform from just a picture of a planet to a world as a planet. We even show the constellations, and you realize a constellation is spread in three dimensions. It's not just, I can talk to you. Sadly, we run out of time. What a play it is. What a pleasure. Please come back again next time you're here. We'd love to have you back. Great, great to finally talk to you. Probably.